Today, we'll talk about why China is mad that leaders of Korea and Japan met Biden at Camp David, and also why India and the Philippines are two key puzzle pieces for Asia. And the real reason may shape the world as we know it for decades to come. Welcome to China Insider, I'm David Zhang. It's time to talk about the U.S. strategy to contain communist China and why India and the Philippines matter a lot. So today's going to be an overview. I don't want to clog you with all the information about the region, which will come with the days ahead uh, once news related to that particular country comes up. But for now, we'll do an overview of what the region looks like. Now, the U.S. is right now making a lot of friends with countries around China. But this is not because the United States is so good at making friends, but rather the main reason is that the Chinese Communist Party pissed off a lot of them. Take South Korea, for example. It used to be quite pro-China because they had a lot of business in China. So it went from a pro-China state to now a more pro-US state. Last week, a summit between Korea, Japan, and the US took place at Camp David. And in fact, we're now seeing a solid defense triangle happening in the northern part of Asia because of China's aggression. Now, the aim of deterring North Korea is, of course, a big factor for Korea, but that's also, by extension, a very big objective to keep China in check. China is mad at the summit and why it took place. I mean, of course they are. China is also quite helpless because they're looking at countries like the Philippines, India, and even Vietnam moving away from its sphere of influence towards working with the United States. Now, geopolitically speaking, this is perhaps the most troublesome situation China has faced on the international front in a very long time. Let's first talk about the summit. Now, at Camp David, Korea's Yoon suk yeol Japan's Fumio Kishida, and President Biden reached three agreements, spirit of Camp David, Camp David principles, and commitment to consult. On a broad scale, it promises close coordination with rapidly changing situations in Asia. While it doesn't explicitly mention if that's going to escalate into a defense agreement, a trilateral one, uh, but it does indicate that despite not mentioning China, everyone knows that the documents are truly targeting China. I mean, when the leaders talk about the situation in South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait or even cases with North Korea, they know who's behind it to try to change the peaceful quota in the region. It's obviously the Chinese Communist Party. Now, in particular, Japan feels greatly threatened by the CCP's ambition uh, because what could happen to Taiwan could very much happen to islands like the Senkaku Islands for Japan. Right? That's why they are the most eager to arm up against China, to defend against the potential aggression. Now, Korea, under the new president, Yoon suk yeol has also realized that the threat of China is beyond anything that they have experienced. And so both Korea and Japan have amended their long historical differences toward a common enemy, the CCP. Now, to understand the region of Indo-Pacific a little bit more, you have to know who the key players are. Now, China's number one goal is to take Taiwan. Why? Well, there are many reasons, but for the strategic portion of it, it's taking Taiwan will break off the first island chain around China. Now, this is a set of countries that go from north to south, which keeps China's naval projection at bay. Now, Taiwan forms the center part of that key for uh, the first island chain. Now, when a war breaks out over Taiwan, all surrounding players and even some far away will be involved. Now, the U.S. will be there, along with Japan, Korea, and Australia. Uh, the Philippines and India will also be supporting in their own ways. We'll talk more about this specifically later. Other countries like the UK will join too, but simply because of the distance uh, and geography, it's too hard for them to engage in a long-term situation. But of course, as we know, this is mainly going to be naval and air warfare. Uh, the geographical difficulties for many other countries could actually keep them away. So they could provide moral supports or supplies. But in reality, the situation near China and Taiwan will be a few countries. Now, take a look at this map. So China is landlocked on the western side and the northern side. Of course, to the north is Russia. To the east are Korea and Japan. And to the south are the Philippines and Taiwan. And to the west is India. Now, if China's near goal is to invade Taiwan, and then to the way to stop China would be to if China somehow experiences an encroachment from all four directions. Now, of course, we know that to north, Russia is not going to go up against China. So that leaves the eastern front, the western front, and the southern front as their focus. Now, an invasion of Taiwan is not just limited to the Taiwan Strait itself. It will be all over Asia. Uh, different scenarios, for example, an invasion of Taiwan could entail a blockade in the South China Sea. And that would mean that an attempt to block off the most important trade route around the world. 
The countries involved would be Vietnam and the Philippines. And the Philippines allows for a strategic location where U.S. forces can quickly engage China's Navy, as well as repairs and supplies. And also, all this while protecting the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea for the ships and the planes transiting through. But the U.S. could also move one step ahead of China and attempt to choke off the Malacca Strait, which, by working with India, will block off the parts which leads into the Malacca Strait. Again, that's the only path in which ships going to China could try to transit through. And so this is why I say India and the Philippines are the two most important pieces of puzzle for this particular scenario. But again, more on that in the second half. Uh, this will greatly affect China's ability to take Taiwan. All the while, on the eastern front, you have Japan, who is very much actively trying to stop the invasion of Taiwan. They will be joined by South Korea, along with the U.S. forces, to send troops to support the United States in Taiwan. Now, aside from the mutual defense agreements and the various security agreements, the complete encirclement keeps China's ability to maneuver in the region, again, behind that first island chain. So in order to localize and minimize the impact of the war, countries around China, they have been working with the U.S. to defend against them economically, militarily, as well as in, in terms of the geopolitical side, trying to encircle China. Now, if this is successful, it could even prevent the attempt to invade Taiwan because the pressure mounting will be so much. But some are now preferring to say that this is the deterrence factor using geography or a delocalized alliance to create an Asian version of NATO. Traditionally, NATO, as you know, is widely known as the attack one, attack all defense pact. And it was created against the Soviet Union. Now, we are in need of something against communist China, but it's looking very much different. It's not a regional defense, but rather, it, well, it is a regional defense, but it's one where it's separated by oceans and seas. So it looks a lot different in Asia. Now, why are India and the Philippines so important to us? Let's first talk about India. While India is unlikely to directly engage China in a fight over Taiwan, it will, however, serve as a great counterweight to China on both the strategic and the economic front. Now, on the strategic front, the U.S. is in the process of creating naval ship repair and maintenance hubs in India, and that will be able to be used for the U.S. forces and naval uh, ships to dock and to repair along with its allies. So this kind of puts the entire projection region for uh, how long they can stay in the Indian Ocean uh, so much bigger than what was already there. And they can greatly improve the U.S. pressure in the Indian Ocean, which again, they can use to block off China's access for shipping vessels trying to get into the South China Sea. And India's border disputes with China has also been a driving factor for the country to move closer to the U.S. The increased attention in manufacturing uh, and, and of course moving factories from China to India is partly due to that geopolitical climate around China. And the other part being that India's own growth. Now, economically speaking, India today is not just one neutral self-identified power in Asia. It's a special, it's a full-fledged superpower in the making. And this makes India the best counter to what is presented in China. Of course, India is free to make choices on who their friends are. They're still in the BRICS, uh, but they also have shown desires to work with the West. What we're clearly seeing now is they're inching towards the U.S., showing that the United States, that India is willing to be a partner in the area. Now, how does this apply to containing China? Well, remember, the west of China is landlocked. It's an expansion for the CCP as well to try to plan that Belt and Road Initiative into countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. So China has so much interest already in that area around the, the countries like India, Pakistan, and it goes all the way down to the Himalayas to a region called Arunachal Pradesh. And in this particular area, China's and India's border conflicts has also escalated in recent years, particularly in the uh, Ladakh region. But historically, we've also seen China being involved in various events, like from Tibetan's spiritual leader, uh, Dalai Lama, who was uh, exiled following the invasion of Tibet to India. But you also have the Pakistan-India conflict in the region, which, of course, is uh, uh, crucial for the U.S. and China. And so for all of these reasons, India is truly facing threats from various aspects related to China. And that's why I think they're closer to the U.S. now. What we're trying to see is if the United States can truly support India's interest in these aspects, because it will greatly reduce China's westward expansion, because, you know, they are limited to how much they can go on the eastern side. Now, this is very all complicated, so it deserves more than just one episode. 
But as so far, what we know is that the complicated situation of the region has created a good chance or a good opportunity for India and the United States to work together to improve what is already there. Uh, some of the more concrete actions that I can think of include moving, say, Apple products, uh, manufacturing or assembly lines from China to India, which I believe they're already doing with the iPhone 15. It also helps that the population of India is now equal or more to that of China, which means that the manufacturing ability of India is much stronger now. And given the country's English literacy and education power, India is really on track to, play, to replace the Chinese manufacturing exports. And this is all while they are in a democratic system. So you don't have the baggage of authoritarian regimes attached to your exports. And so it's a perfect counter to China, and it's one that the US desperately needs right now. Now let's talk about the Philippines. For many years, the Philippines has been bullied by China's Coast Guards, including harassments for its shipping vessels. And recently, a Chinese Coast Guard ship fired a water cannon at Filipino supply ships. Now, sometimes China even has fishing vessels that are in disguise. Uh, in actuality, they're controlled by the Chinese Coast Guards or paramilitary units with armed soldiers on board. Now, earlier in this year's uh, South China Sea events, the Philippines captured China using a military-grade laser against its boats. And so, long story short, the CCP constantly bullies the Filipinos and, and causing them to lose a lot of the economic uh, abilities uh, such as fishing and uh, supplies in the South China Sea. And so that big trouble today has mounted to be so much that the Philippines is moving once again closer to the US and farther from China. So the Philippines is very much fed up with China's attempts. And you know, I always say this is all China's own karma, their own doing that's causing countries to move away. The United States has promised the Philippines to uphold the freedom of navigation and its mutual defense pacts. And so in cases that China can't stop doing the bullying, well, it, it's a perfectly legitimate reason for the United States to step up and protect the interest of the region. Now, they are also in the, uh, in the process of allowing US forces to station at four bases in the country. Take a look at this map here. Three of them are very close to Taiwan. And so in a direct war with China, the Philippines they may not be involved in the sense of sending troops, but the perfect location allows them to serve as an important strategic factor to stop China. Right? If China attempts to blockade on Taiwan, it means that they could cut off ships attempting to enter Taiwan's ports, the US now has an excuse for protecting the freedom of navigation, at least to the south of Taiwan in the Bashi Channel, where it is closer to the islands of Philippines, and to attempt to break off that blockade. And this also allows the U.S. to station its air force and naval forces in the Philippines, which reduces greatly the response time against China's invasion. So without India and the Philippines, we really can't complete the China strategy to stop it from attacking Taiwan. And if deterrence fails, then the same countries are the reason why we have a chance to stop China once the invasion breaks out. And that's really it. This is not just about one country, the U.S. versus China. It's about friends rallying together against a bully. And that's the story of Asia today. And that's it today for the episode on why the Philippines and India matter so much in the grand strategy uh, in Asia right now. Particularly, you have countries like South Korea and Japan also being key partners. What it looks like from an overarching perspective. If you enjoy the content, leave a like, subscribe to our channel, and comment below what your thoughts are. And let me know what you think should be a good idea to talk about next for China. All right, I'm David Zhang. This is China Insider. See you next time.